<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Everybody needs to unmute themselves for just a second quickly and say hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Come to the Lakers. We got close to 200 hellos in there. Everybody can mute themselves again. Um, fantastic to see you all here. Um, thank you, Jasmine, for letting everybody in um, from the waiting room. I'm going to be very brief in my intro of Chris and my intro of our co-moderators because we have a lot to talk about today. Um, Chris Paul, you all know who he is, NBA All-Star, been in the league since 2005, now playing for OKC. He also serves as a, in a very critical and visible role as president of the NBA Players Association. Okay, full disclosure here, Chris is a tremendous friend of my husband's and as a result, his, um, he's been really generous in his friendship with me but also by extension with all of you, our Annenberg students. He visited us in 2017. Chris, you look a little younger then. I knew, um, I knew who you were before I knew who your husband was. Let's just go back to you. <laughs> all right, awesome. Um, but you've been super generous. You, you came to talk to us at school. You surprised us at one of our Maymester dinners. Um, you really freely share your wisdom and, and advice. You know, when you came in 2017, here's what I said about you. I, I introduced you as, a true leader with exceptional strategic communication instincts who has used his voice across multiple platforms effectively and authentically in both his professional and personal lives. I think we can all agree, Chris, and in addition to all that you have done prior to this, leading teams, improving the communities that you've lived in and played in, speaking out about issues that you care about, this year has tested those communication skills and those leadership abilities in extraordinary ways. And you have led in equally extraordinary ways, um, certainly helping to shape a global conversation about social justice and racial equity and put aside, frankly, any questions about the role of sports, the power of sports to affect social change. So Chris, thank you for joining us. I'm going to introduce you to my co-moderators today, um, Tony Hall. Tony, wave and say hello. Tony's a master's student in our specialized journalism program with a concentration in sports journalism. She's from Houston, Texas, and now living in San Antonio. And she came to us from Prairie View A&M, as you all know, an HBCU um, in Prairie View, Texas. Um, Sam, Sam, wave and say hi. Sam is a junior journalism major and a business finance minor at USC. He served as sports director of Annenberg Media. And then he's um, just this summer founded Dash Sports TV, which is a startup sports commentary publication where he leads a staff of about 30 students um, with reps from all the Pac-12 schools. And then Reagan, Reagan wave and say hello. Reagan Griffin hey. Jr. is a sophomore um, with us, majoring in journalism, an avid sports fan, especially football and basketball. He wants to be a sports analyst comfortable with tackling all mediums and intersections. He hosts a variety of radio um, sports programs, including Sports Scene, and of course, I've already forgotten the other two names, Reagan, so I'm sorry. And he's also been published in the Undefeated, Chris. I'll send you that um, link afterwards in addition to Annenberg Media. So I'm going to kick off the conversations. My co-moderators are going to join me, but then I want to make sure you all know um, who are joining us via Zoom, use the, the chat. Go ahead and pop your questions into the chat as we go. And um, when we get to the Q&A portion, I'll try to have, give you an opportunity to unmic yourself um, and ask your own questions. So Chris, welcome. I was going to start by asking you how you managed your re-entry um, to life outside the bubble, but you answered that in part with last night's news. So I want to start with that. Last night during game three, um, in your role as MBPA president, you um, announced that 90% of the league's players had registered to vote. Only about 20% had been registered to vote a month ago in August. Um, how did you do that? And why is this so important? Um, first and foremost, thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm in class myself too. So uh, it's, it's cool to get a little break from, from all the calls to talk about some of this stuff. But um, just to let you know, so 
what happened was obviously I've been at the union for a while now. So what we knew was that in the last two elections, it was around 20% of our players that voted. All right. And to tell you the truth, uh, we knew that information, but that's not something that you share with everybody. Never had plans on everybody knowing that, but uh, it became a real conversation when we were in that room trying to decide whether or not we should play or not play and use our platforms uh, when we basically took that time in between games to have like a break, like a reset, because everybody was sort of getting overwhelmed. So, of course, if you say something in a room full of 200, 300 guys, you're not just talking to them, you're talking to everybody else. So obviously that got out and it started being sort of news headlines everywhere, which is, you know, sort of the gift and the curse, right? So obviously when you first hear it and I would hear all the talking heads on TV talking about it, I was cringing, I was mad, right? But then it also was sort of an awakening because it let guys know, you know, if we're going to do our part, we got to do our part. And so, uh, we've been working on it, uh, a lot of different people, a lot of different people from the union, um, people from the league, everybody. Uh, a woman that works for the Oklahoma City Thunder named Ayana has been like daily. She would send me updates. We got this amount of teams. We got this amount of guys. These few guys from this team, not yet, you know, and, we, and we're still working. But it was really nice last night to announce that we got over 90 percent, over 90 percent, because we have such a young league, too. So this will be a lot of guys in our league first time voting. So, um, and there's a lot of international guys who can't vote, <laughs> right? They can't vote. So uh, it's, it, was, um, it was a real dope feeling being able to announce that last night. And I know a lot of guys in our league were happy about it. Um, congrats, Chris, um, for accomplishing that. That's amazing. You. you mentioned being in school. Give us a quick update. Yeah, so um, I went to Wake Forest University two years on a full scholarship. It was amazing. Uh, I went back and took some classes when my son was born. That was tough. But then as I've been championing for HBCUs over all this time, I was like, man, I want to go back to school. Not only do I want to go back, I want to graduate from an HBCU, which is Winston-Salem State University, which is in my hometown. And I found out like a month or two ago that my dad went to Winston-Salem State but he only went for a semester. He was, they found him at the basketball gym more than he was in class, but it's still a great story. But um, yes, I'm, I'm uh, majoring in communications and hope to graduate from uh, Winston-Salem State, hopefully before it's time for little Chris to graduate. <laughs> Are you actually taking classes online right now? Do you have any yes, I have for all these students that you're surrounded by who are also taking classes online? Yeah, don't procrastinate. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. And um, it's, it's been very interesting, uh, obviously. And a lot of people don't, didn't know this, but my first day of classes was the first day of the playoffs. Like I had a game and I had to like submit to some of my classmates. And that's what was interesting too, because there's like a message board and our teacher told us we had to reply to at least two classmates. And I'm Applying and then people start inboxing me like, yo, is this Chris? Like, yeah, I'm in class just like you. <laughs> so. um, that's amazing. Chris, so, Chris, I was a working student, but I wasn't exactly playing NBA games um, while, while responding to the online uh, the chat function. You, so, know the, you know the person who get on my nerves to tell you the truth, Willow, is my mom. I love my mom to death, but my mom has access to my school stuff. So, She'll, she'll hit me and be like, hey, have you, have you did this assignment? When the last time you looked at your canvas? When, I'd be like, mom, I, I do other stuff. Like, do you not realize I'm working? I got my kids, but my mama, if she don't leave me alone. Your mom is the best. I know you know that. I know you know that deeply. Yeah, your mom yeah. is the best. And as a somewhat micromanaging mother, I so appreciate that story. <laughs> Um, Chris, I want to talk to you. I, I, you know, I mentioned in the intro that your leadership through the pandemic and the racial justice movement has just been extraordinary. Um, you know, you've always led your teams, you've always led your communities, but you were really called on to lead the players, first getting them into the bubble, and then through, after that, a series of extraordinary events. I know that my co-moderators here have lots of questions for you about this, but I thought maybe I'd ask you just to start with the bubble itself creating it, getting the players there safely, and determining that you were going to use it as a platform for racial justice. An epic challenge at the time. 
give us a sense of how monumental that task was and what skills you called on in yourself to make it happen. Man, whew, it's, it's all such a blur, but it's funny because I'm sitting in my office where I sat every day. Every single day there were phone calls happening. And um, first we started with a small group. It was just like me, Adam, uh, Byron, Kiki, and um, Kyle Lowry, and um, Dwight Powell. It was a small group of us that were just talking about the possibilities. So that was one aspect of talking about it. But then the union side, right? We're talking, I'm having calls with the executive committee too, because we're trying to figure out this is guys' livelihoods. Like what's next? What, what does the league look like for us? So it's crazy. I just thought about this, but it was like two totally different things. We're trying to figure out what finance looks like for all the players and what direction the union is going on on this side. And on this side, we're trying to figure out if we're going to finish the season. And so um, the, the different things that you have to call on is like, first of all, time management. And I give a huge shout out to my family for that because also I have two kids who are being homeschooled, right? So thankfully my wife is holding down that fort and allowing me to be in here on these calls day in and day out and, and do that. And then it was uh, communication. I, I, it sounds so simple, but in these situations, you almost want to over communicate, mm -hmm. right? Everything that was going on, any decision that was made, I made sure that I wasn't the only player involved, involved in these calls. Because as much as I know, and as much as I think of things, you'd be surprised when you get another guy on the call and he's like, yo, we should have this, we should have this. So then when we actually started figuring out how we we're gonna play, we started having other committees, right? And it was funny, it was like four different like subcommittees. And sometimes, you know, I can try to micromanage and stuff like that. And it's crazy, I, I, like Willow, like I talk about Bob all the time, but it's amazing the things that I've learned from him and how to like allow people to be great in their roles, right? You control what you can control, but once you give somebody a position, trust them, right? So out of the four subcommittees, I think I might have ended up being on three, <laughs> but not all four. And I put, um, it was different guys. I called Russell Westbrook, right? I said, look, Russ, I want you to get on this committee, right? Called Jason Tatum. You know, I said, you're a young guy. I want you to be involved in this so you can see how all this stuff works. So you start putting different guys in position to make make everything come together and so it was it was a lot you you think about the testing protocols and when family can come and and you get a lot of pushback right because you got 400 something players right so you're trying to make sure you have the greater goods like that well-being but there's guys who call and be like look i don't think we should be playing and you're like, I respect your decision, but we got a full body of players and we got to vote on it. So uh, communication is very key. And it was a lot of phone calls, right? I would be in here all day or something, and then I'd be at dinner with my wife and I get a text from a player that I might not have a relationship with and I, I have to take that call. And that's the position that you're in, especially when I'm president of a union, that I have to be able to talk to whoever. And I'll say this real quick. I don't like everybody in the league and everybody don't like me, right? Just being honest with you. And a lot of people don't like me. Just get that straight. That is okay. That is perfectly okay. Cause when you're in this position, you got to delegate and understand that other people may have better relationships. Andre Iguodala, who has been my right hand through all of this stuff. That's why we sort of divide and conquer, right? That's why we have so many guys on our executive committee is to make sure that, the message is getting out, out there and you're trying to make guys feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you were collab collaborating, you were delegating, you were educating, and you were also building capacity, right? You were training a generation to take on these positions and, and take on these roles um, after that and, and getting everybody into the bubble. So the bubble as a platform, so many issues that you all had to consider there, but just would love to get you to share a little bit of the thinking and how you led players through the on-court messaging. You know, how did you get to the place where players were using their jerseys, long regulated as league uniforms, as a powerful messaging vehicle, 
and using the court, Black Lives Matter painted on the court. How did you get to that place? Man, you ask some good questions, Willow. I tell you, I do a lot of interviews. People just, don't ask me all this stuff. Just wait till the students kick in. You think, ah, oh, she was okay. They were really good. So I, I'll tell you the way you get there, right? And this is why I always say I'm so blessed and fortunate to be in the, the, the position that I'm in is because I don't know everything. So through all this, one thing that I got a chance to do is become a lot more educated. So when different things arose and players were like, man, we shouldn't play, what should we, like I was battling too with that, right? When obviously when we first stopped playing, it was because of COVID. Then the George Floyd incident happened and it was a whole nother story. And so as a, as a black man uh, with, you know, black kids, black family and everything, I'm just like any other player, like, should we play? And you know, you got a lot of people saying, nah, man, it's gonna take the attention off of what's going on. And so trying to, when you're in this position, one thing you don't get to do is you don't get to say, ah, I kind of feel this way, I kind of feel that way. At some point you gotta be definitive. And that's what happens when you're in leadership positions. And so what I did was I talked to a lot of people smarter than me, right? One of the people that I really leaned on was Killer Mike, right? Killer Mike was unbelievable in just sort of being a sounding board. I could call and talk to him. David West, a former player in the league. I called D West. It's a, it's a number of people. I'm not even sure they want me to share, but I reached out to a lot of people. Uh, I got a chance to talk to Van Jones. I talked to a number of people about the different issues and how could we um, make sure our voices are heard. All right. And so then when it came to the jerseys, the jerseys uh, was just a thought because it's like, Guys are saying we're gonna go play, but we want this message to be loud. We wanna make sure it's not like we just forgot about everything. And so obviously there were some guys who were like, cool. Some guys are like, no, you know, but it was just a, a way for us to keep a spotlight on the reason why we were going to play, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people say, everybody has their own why. I'm going to play because I need to hoop. I need to go play because of money, but Majority of our guys, their reason for going to play was to make sure that this platform was used. So any way we could do that, we wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. um, Ray, and I'm going to turn it over to you now because I know you have more questions about um, how Chris led through the rest of this journey. Reagan? I do. Uh, Chris, thanks for coming out, man. I, I know I speak for everyone that's in this room when I say, you know, it's very much appreciated to take the time out. Um, oh. I want to give a shout out to my dad real quick and I'll get to it why, but my dad really rammed in my head growing up that, you know, leadership is a highly important quality, right? Um, and because that was rammed in my head so much, you know, I think I can identify a good leader when I see it. And I do think that you have identified yourself as one of the best leaders in the NBA. Um, but that leadership was put to the test recently, right? August 26, 2020. That's the day for the history books. And I think you remember that day. Um, that's when Sterling Brown and the Milwaukee Bucks, they made the decision, we're not gonna play tonight. We're going to have a player strike. Everyone identified that as a strike, not a boycott, because that was a withhold of labor. Um, they made that decision. So what I'd like for you to do, if you don't mind, you walk us through what your role was, and really just your feelings and emotions upon hearing about Jacob Blake and the seven bullets that were put into his back. Um, when you heard about the decision that Milwaukee made, the role that you had to take on as the president of the MVPA, um, balancing all of those different things that were going on, all the nuts and bolts that, that were happening. Can you walk us through that process within that time frame and what it felt like for you as a leader? Yeah, uh, man, um, I, I probably haven't had that feeling too often as far as sort of overwhelmed and you, you sort of got to take it all in. But um, what was happening in the bubble was, and I'll just give you all a little perspective from a player, is that um, we you're sort of away from your family, right? And so you're here. And while I'll tell you some, some things about it, I think there were a lot more positives than negatives when it comes to the bubble, but there are, you know, ups and downs when you're in a situation like that. And so the games are happening every other day, right? Everything is happening so fast. And we're away from our families and social injustice stuff is, is still occurring, right? So you're like, man, I'm trying to be this best athlete, best player, player that I can be, but, I'm not okay with what's happening, right? But the day is still going on, right? So we're seeing this stuff that's happening on our phone and we're like, man, I wanna do something about it. Then they're like, uh, you got pregame. <laughs> you know, it's time, it's time to play. 
and you're actually not having an opportunity to to take it all in and so as, as the different things happen uh myself jalen brown andre Godala, a lot of us were dealing with things in real time and actually the day before that was on august 26 you said sorry all this stuff right august 26 yeah august 25th um myself and andre Godala had went over and had a meeting with um the celtics and the raptors who weren't sure they were going to play um their next game right so then on the 26th um, I actually had talked to Adam that morning or whatnot, didn't, didn't know anything. So, you know, when you show up to the game, we were pulling into the arena and that's when my phone started going crazy and it immediately became a discussion, right? It's a discussion. This is, this is what's going on right now. And I had teammates on, on the bus look back at me. And so, you know, once, you know, you don't know what's going on, you're like, okay, I gotta get on the phone. I think Braun called me, Dame Lillard called me, and then we started communicating. We started figuring it out because it's one of those things that um, you, you, sort of, you sort of deal with it. And us as a brotherhood, when we saw what Milwaukee did, it was like, we, we stand with them, right? We stand with them. And then the next thing that um, I tried to do was make sure we had a meeting, right? Like everybody, everybody, like because of COVID and everything, everything has to be socially distant, right? I'm not saying we threw it out the window with our meeting. We had the chair socially distant, but we needed to talk. We needed to talk. And the whole time we had been down there in Orlando, all of our talks had been like this. It had been over Zoom, right? We had did a call with First Lady Michelle Obama and the WNBA ladies got on there and everything was Zoom. But when this happened, we needed to talk face to face. So I uh, made a couple phone calls. Uh, amazing lady at the NBA, Kelly Flatel. She is a rock star for the things that she's been controlling. They took out one of the courts in a ballroom, <laughs> right, where a lot of teams was practicing. Uh, coordinated, um, let the coaches know we wanted them at the meeting. Um, you know, the referees wanted to come to the meeting, but it was a hard decision to say no to them. And it wasn't anything personal, but we, I knew just from experience that we needed to have real conversations. And the only way that can happen sometimes is if players are comfortable with the people in the room, right? And tell you the truth, we had the coaches in there initially, then a few guys said they didn't want the coaches in there. That was neither here nor there, respected their decision, coaches left. But what it did was it gave us an opportunity to talk face to face, let everyone get their real raw emotion feelings out. In the meeting, Sure, it's been documented everywhere. Got a little heated here and there or whatnot. Cool. At the end of that meeting, we said, all right, everybody, go back to your room. Take all this in that everybody talked about. Let's come back tomorrow and we'll figure it out. So I, my 15th year in the league, been with the union now for since like 2008. Never seen anything like it. And I'm, I'm grateful because I feel like it's a turning point in our league. Whereas a lot of guys spoke in that meeting that would maybe not have spoken. And the coaches who spoke up, let me give a quick shout out to, cause y'all probably, but John Lucas, who was assistant coach of mine in Houston, who's a former player, man, he gave one of the best speeches I ever heard in my life. Like in my life, like the way he spoke and as a former player who remember when the salaries were a certain thing and he had everybody in there laughing had everybody in there laughing, and he was serious at the same time. Uh, Doc Rivers uh, spoke really well, uh, and so did Armand Hill. Armand Hill is a former player in the league, assistant coach for the Clippers. But whenever you're in a lot of these different type conversations, you want as much wisdom, right? A lot of times people say old people. No, I say wisdom. <laughs> it's wisdom because these people have been through things like this before. No doubt. I, you said a lot that resonated, uh, particularly with me, man, especially at the top of what your response was. When you say you have all these things that you're trying to digest, but you got to go out there and hoop because, you know, you got a job to do and you have to still go through the motions of daily life. I guarantee you that resonated with every single black person in this room. Because, yeah. you know, even about hearing the Rihanna Taylor, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the ruling there, you know, I still had midterms that week. I still had, you know, papers to do. And, and you know, that's something that's difficult to go through. But I want to talk about what came out of that meeting. You guys had discussions with the ownership and, and you agreed on committees and, and more social justice messaging during the playoffs. 
um, and converting the, the, the arenas into uh, voting places for people to go and, and make their voices heard, kind of tying in with LeBron's more than a vote, making sure everybody makes their voices heard. And I'm not going to lie to you, man, as impactful those things are going to be, and I have no doubt that those things will have a strong impact, I do think that it's incumbent on the NBA governors that they do a little bit more and they get their hands a little bit dirtier than that rather than just throwing money at it and opening up their stadiums. What does it look like from y'all's point of view as the players in terms of holding these guys a little bit more accountable moving forward? Yeah, that's, that's great that you, you say that. And I think for us players, first and foremost, we wanted to have a conversation, right? We wanted to talk to them and, and let them know uh, what we're passionate about. So uh, obviously, the George Floyd police bill, right? If you if you sort of know about that, like that's that's a big thing, and guys are down well in the bubble fighting for these different social justices, and we understand that the governors of our teams what role they play in, right? So once again, we we play the games, right? Like we're we're athletes, like we're we're not experts on these uh, different issues but we do have access to them. So with us starting this uh, coalition, right, this justice coalition, because that's the thing, we had to decide, like, if we go back and play, is this gonna stop like social justice from happening? No, not really, not if we're playing. Like we can use our platforms, but we really wanted to have something sustainable and continue to grow so that when something does happen, we do have these resources and these experts who have sort of been, uh, lining up a path, right? So uh, Hakeem Jeffries, Jeffries, right? We had a call with him the other day, the union uh, congressman. And I told him as athletes, we like to know, right? Like if I eat like this, if I train like this, I'll have an opportunity to win the championship. He was amazing the other day and talking to us about, you need to do this. You know, if, if the Senate is flipped, this is how you get this. Right. So us as athletes, like we want to know what we need to do step by step. And I think that's what we sort of found out. And that was the first time, like I said, my 15 years, there's been a conversation like that with all the governors. Right. Like mm -hmm. where it was players and we sat there and we told them, we was like, look, this is what this is what we need. Like starting right now. Right. This is what we need. And. Like J.R. Smith, I don't know if you guys saw, he actually called New Newark's mayor and got that set up as a, a, a polling center, All right? So everything happens in steps, <laughs> right? And so you start somewhere and I think, I think we're gonna continue to grow like that. Cool. Hey, thanks, Reagan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn, and Chris, I'm gonna turn to Tony, um, cause I know she has, she wants to get a slightly different sense of how you manage through all of this, Tony? Yes. Once again, thank you so much for being here. I mean, I like Reagan said, we speak for all. We appreciate you taking the time out being here. Your opinion matters so much. And thank you so much for what you're doing on the behalf of HBCUs. From a fellow HBCU grad, what you're doing is extremely powerful and it's not going unseen. I definitely want you to know that. Sure. But throughout your career, you have maintained such high spirits through different transitions, changes, and battles. What has kept you so grounded when all odds are put against you? Um, uh, I don't know. I think I understand that I live sort of like an abnormal life, but the fact that I always got my family around me or whatnot, they keep you grounded. <laughs> Especially like I'm, I always say this, I'm fortunate to have mom and dad. Right, a lot of people just get to shout out mom, but my dad, my dad just turned sixty a uh, day before yesterday. Uh, I think he in there in the living room or whatnot or something like that. But my parents came out from from North Carolina for a few days, and realizing that like basketball is sort of my gift, it's my like sort of my tool, is taking me all across the world, gave me an opportunity to meet so many different people. But it's not who I am. Right, it's how I express myself. It's my happy place, right? And it's gave me so much education on things bigger than just like a lob or a jump shot, right? I even think about health, right? I got traded to LA, and that's when I finally like started eating a little bit better. And then within the last 
year and a half last June, like I went plant-based. I ain't telling nobody how to live their life, first and foremost. I'm just saying like, for me, it changed my life from a health and like performance, right? So me, like I love basketball. Like, I mean, some people like it, just to keep it real with you. Some people like it for what it can bring, bring them, right? And, and it is what it is, it's your why. It's like, you might like girls, you might like money, you might like whatever, but I like love basketball. Like I wake up in the morning still now at 5.30 and I'm on this thing called um, uh, Second Spectrum and I'm watching like games. I'm watching every shot out of Mr. Mate and I love it, I love it. So um, that keeps me competitive because I'm 35, I, I have to guard 19 and 20 year olds. I want an advantage. So if I got to eat well and keep training or whatnot, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I just, I love that. Basketball has sort of been that. If I couldn't hoop, I probably wouldn't be here, Willow. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I couldn't hoop, you know what I mean? It's, it's taken me so, so many different places. And I feel like I would be the biggest dummy not to get educated on a lot of other things along the way. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, Sam, I'm going to toss it over to you for a question. Awesome. Chris, thank you again for taking the time um, to be here and speak to us. I know we're all very excited to have you here. Um, I want to touch on something you brought up a little bit ago, um, and you brought up on Russell Wilson's podcast, Danger Talk, recently. Um, so if you guys haven't seen it, I, everyone here should watch that podcast. It was great. Um, Chris, you were just a guest there. And you talked about how the bubble gave you uh, as players, a bigger platform than you might normally have in a regular game and how it allowed for you guys to actually have, you know, conversations with each other. It wasn't finish a game, get on the bus and leave and, you know, maybe text with each other or talk about things. So you had time to discuss social issues, mental health issues, um, and other yeah. topics with each other. Um, so as president of the NBA PA, do you have any plans or have considered any plans to kind of foster that discussion um, once the bubble uh, ends? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we actually talked about doing a call uh, this week or next week just to check in on guys, right? Because the mental health is a whole nother thing, right? When you talk about the bubble, because when you come out, uh, it takes some getting used to. It takes some getting used to. And I think a lot of times, uh, and I told Willow this before, a lot of times people think about just us when we come out of the bubble, right? I was away from my family for 70 some days, right? My kids. And so selfishly, you think like, how am I going to adjust? But the other thing is how are my kids going to adjust, right? Dad has been gone for a long time, right? And in, when you're in the bubble, you're around each other who's being tested every day. That's the other thing. Like I'll never forget the first day I got out the bubble and I got back home to LA and I was side-eyeing everybody, <laughs> right? I was looking at everybody like, I ain't really been around nobody who I didn't know was tested, right? So I was, I was nervous in that aspect. And so um, there's definitely going to be ongoing conversations with guys to, to see how they feel um, mentally, but also the fact that we got all these guys registered to vote, now the next thing is getting out to vote, right? It does no good if you get them registered and then they, they're not voting, but um, it's, it's really a new day because guys, we, we, got, we have guys in our league that are actually going to go volunteer and be poll workers. Right. I don't know when that's ever happened in, in, in a professional sports league. And I know you didn't ask this, but I'll tell you this. And this is one of the dopest parts about being in the NBA, too. Um, I think guys really got a chance to see how much our league leads. Right. And so when everything was going on, uh, a lot of us have relationships with other guys in other leagues. And these guys from these other leagues were calling us like, yo, what y'all doing? Mm -hmm. Right. What y'all going to do? OK, cool. We're going to do that, too. You know, this guy from this league, hey, what y'all going to do? What, what, okay, that's what we're going to do. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it may be a lot of pressure, right, for our players because they realize the influence, but it's, it's a good, good position to be in to know that other leagues respect our league as much as they do. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, Chris, we also had Mike Bass 
couple of weeks ago. Mm. Um, come join us and and talk about kind of the history of the NBA as kind of in many ways laying the building blocks for the league and its players to be at a place where they where they are today because it really has been an evolution um, over time. I think and you're right. You all you all uh, as a league and as players are are leading the way. Sam, I know you have a question about sports journalists, and then I'm gonna. And then I want to talk about your production um, company. I see you with your O-Dip shirt on. <laughs> so Sam, you go ahead with the with that question, and then uh, and then we'll shift gears a little bit. Absolutely. I uh, see a lot of familiar faces on the, the call, having worked in the, the media center. We have a lot of journalism students on the call, um, a lot of sports journalism students. And one thing that happens a lot in sports journalism, uh, specifically with sports commentators, is they don't really see you know, or talk about the athlete as a person. They talk about them as a body on the field. Uh, recent example, when Skip Bayless uh, came out and said, you know, I don't have sympathy for Dak Prescott going public with, I got depressed because of COVID. Um, and after that, my colleague Reagan here uh, issued a challenge on one of the shows that I produce. And the challenge was for sports journalists to do better uh, and really consider what they say about athletes and to very frankly, treat them as human beings like you would any other person um, and acknowledge those other factors and what they and the effects they have on on athletes. So my question to you, uh, from an athlete's perspective, what can journalists or sports commentators like the rising ones we have here in the media center uh, really do in their everyday reporting, interviewing to ensure they don't fall into that trap? Man, that's a, that's a hell of a question, Sam. And I, I can give you guys some uh, some like personal experience, sort of like with journalists, who, whoever it may be. And first things first, I'll tell you, some of the stuff is clickbait, right? Or once you start to figure it out, you know, I mean, no disrespect, but sometimes I say talking heads because sometimes they won't even believe a certain thing and they may just say it, right? Just because that's going to get people engaged in that show. But I think one thing that you can learn in journalism um, is respect is more valuable than anything, right? And what happens, I think, now this day and age where it's all about who can get it first, right? And at some point we forgot about getting it correct and it's about who gets it first, right? So as much as you can, I know a lot of journalism is founded on relationships and stuff like that, is that guys will respect it a lot more if you take the time to get it right than get it first. And so, when I, when I say that, it um, just sort of makes me think, I mean, I've, I've had a number of situations where somebody will, you know, write something or whatnot, and I sort of cringe, and then I see them, and then you just like, well, you, you tried to get it first, but didn't take the time to, to get it right. And it's unfortunate, and I'm sure, how many of y'all have seen um, The Last Dance? All right? Yeah, Willow's in The Last Dance. But apart from the last dance that I will never forget, and I use this example all the time, is Horace Grant, right? I think it was Horace Grant. And I don't know what's true or what not, but there was a point in that uh, documentary where all the guys that had played for the Bulls was talking about how a story had been, been written and all of them pointed at who? Horace Grant. They was like, Oh, that's Horace Grant that was talking to the media. That was Horace Grant. And I've always been a guy where I will never do that as far as like talking to the media about in-house stuff, right? Because one thing about it, guys on the team, they know. They know. That's why in that, that documentary, all of them was like, Horace, Horace. Horace said he didn't. But when you're on a team, you know who the person is telling like everybody's business or whatnot with the team. And I've always sort of been cautious or whatnot as far as dealing with different journalists, whoever it is. I'll, I'll speak about union things and stuff like that, but you, you always have to be careful uh, of putting, you know, teammates against each other. But if that's the story, if it's true, as much as you can, as much as you possibly can, concentrate on getting it right and not getting it first. Because I know a number of guys who, once you try to get it first and you don't have it right, they offer you. So Chris, I wonder how that, how you then think about that, getting it right, not getting it first. Now that you're in, you've become a documentary producer, you've got ODIP Productions, 
Um, you might have to explain to me the significance of ODIP. Um, yeah, I can do that. ODIP okay. is, is like me and my brother. It's funny because Russ, Braun, everybody, they always say that. Like if something happened, we'd be like, oh, dip, instead of saying like, oh, such and such. And we literally got it from Welcome Home, R Roscoe Jenkins. All there was right. a in movie where Mike Epps said that right before the family uh, cookout or the family relay race, uh, Mike Epps said it as an ad lib. So, yeah. Um, thank you. I, I, as you know, I, I sent you a note after your Quibi series, Blackballed. I'm going to put my full view on, have, um, just to see everybody. Um, how many of you saw Blackballed? Okay. So, you know what, Chris, is it okay if I just show them a... Absolutely. Trailer? Absolutely. All right. So, Reggie, just run the trailer of Black Vault. Do you know that you have a whole team that's black that plays for you? You just, do I know? The Clippers, burdened by ignorant, racist comments made by its owner. I support them and give them food. When I listened to it, I had to listen to it again because I was like, man, he didn't just say that. If you don't stand for something, then you're part of the problem. Who gives it to them? Does someone else give it to them? Who makes the game? Do I make the game or do they make the game? Each generation is faced with the issues of their times. Seeing CNN and Fox News and realizing this was much bigger than anything I had ever faced before. Social injustice, it's bigger than basketball. It's bigger than anything. Words hurt. I was always taught to fight. No other story matters. The NBA is in trouble because you heard the dreaded B word. Boycott. This is big news. That was it, though. That was the beginning of the fire. You had this new generation of athletes saying, we stand in the tradition of people like Muhammad Ali, like Tommy Smith, like John Carlos. This history matters. There was so much going on. Basketball was like one of the last things on any of our minds. Hell, we don't play for him anyway. We play for each other. Oh, I got it! Effective immediately. Yes, I got it! I am banning Mr. Sterling for life. Um, it was a great trailer and it was a really as I, I texted you after I'd finished seeing it, it was a really really well done docu-series why did you take on this topic or, or maybe more broadly how are you thinking about using your production company are these the kinds of projects you're going to continue and then if you could just give us a little window into what it's like producing a series on Quibi which is a which is a different format yeah, so what I um, realized some years ago, sort of when we started our production company, when the first thing that we did was chapter three, which was me going from uh, LA to Houston. And so what I realized as far as having a production company is that over all these years I've been in the league, I'm on my 13th shoe. And so with shoes, right, in the shoe business, you're telling stories, right? So through every one of my shoes, like we told a story, like every last one of my shoes, you can look on it and find a Chevron logo somewhere. And that's uh, for my grandfather. My grandfather had the first black owned service station in North Carolina. So telling stories was cool that way. And then what I realized is that who can tell your stories better than you, <laughs> right? So if I wanted to tell people about how I got to the decision to go from LA to Houston, let me tell it myself instead of letting one of these networks go out there and say, this is why you did this, this is why you did that. So fortunately I, and what's crazy even about that Willow, and I'm not sure you know this, but I love pictures. <clears throat> I love pictures, I got video. So I even took a little camera with me, a GoPro to the bubble. And it only worked probably like the first week, but at the end of each day I would sit and I would talk to it just cause I feel like I do so much. That's like, I forgot about this till you just showed it, but I do so much and how do you remember it? So I love pictures and I love videos. 
So when I was going from LA to Houston, uh, I went and met with uh, Jay-Z, right? And I went and met with Bob. And then um, I asked them, could I record it just to have for my archive years from now so I can realize how I got to this decision. Sure enough, we put it together. It was Bob's idea to, <laughs> to put it together. Boom, we did that. So then uh, the Sterling situation. So a lot of this stuff happens and I usually don't ever say anything, <laughs> right? But then when I saw this opportunity to tell the story with the guys that I played with, that was a great opportunity. Um, it's like the story of how my trade to the Lakers got nixed. We ain't did that one yet, but at some point we'll, <laughs> we'll tell that story. It's crazy. I feel like I've been a part of so many unbelievable stories, but then what was started happening is I realized that I could, sort of uh, do, do other things. We're working on a project about a story um, in Wilmington, right? Um, it's, it's a lot of different things. We got a project about the score, the, when I scored 61 points. Um, because I went plant-based, we're doing a, a, a thing right now about plant-based lifestyle. So I love telling stories, right? And it doesn't just have to be my story. And that's why, you know, we, we started Odip. Great, thanks. Tony, I'm going to let you ask the last of our moderated questions, and I'm going to, I'm going to go to the audience um, for some questions. Tony, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I see you have begun to venture off in so many different lanes. I, you're not just Chris Paul, the basketball player. You're Chris Paul, the student. You're Chris Paul, the producer. So when your career is set and done, and you have to officially hang up your shoes, what do you want your legacy to be remembered by on and off the court? Man, that's a hell of a question, Tony. Sheesh. Um, I always say this, and I mean it. If, if, if I'm done playing and everybody talking about how many assists I had, how many, like, obviously, everything is always how many championships you got, right? If I heard how many jokes of how many times I ain't been out the second round and how many times I don't have a championship, and I'm not going to lie to you. I'm the most competitive person you'll ever meet, I'm telling you. But I also, it probably might have been a couple of years ago, like that doesn't bother. Once upon a time, that would bother me, right? Somebody said this, somebody, I like, I'm in such a better place mentally and spiritually just because I know how much good has happened and I know who I am and what I do, right? I think things like that affect you when you don't necessarily know who you are, right? And so for me, the proudest thing that I've done since I've been in the NBA, right, is that some years ago, we the only professional league that um, our retired players have health care, right? And so when you're 19, 20 years old and coming to the NBA, you ain't thinking about that. You don't know nothing about a copay. You don't know nothing about none of that stuff, right? But everywhere I go now and any game we play, anytime I travel and I see a former player and I didn't do it for this, right? And it wasn't just me, we had to take it to the players and we voted on it. But uh, anytime I go somewhere and I see a former player, they say, man, thank you, thank you. Because those players that came before us sacrificed a lot, right? And they don't make the money that we make now. And so you think about the injuries that they endured over their years and it's, it wasn't until I became an adult that I appreciated this, right? Like healthcare. And so all of uh, the players that played in the league years ago or whatnot, they're covered now uh, as a result of us player, players voting on it. So when I'm done playing, that will always be the number one thing, but I still want to be involved in, in business. Eventually my goal is to own a team, right? Like coaching has went through my mind before, right? but it always runs right out of my mind because I've missed so much of my kids, right? I've missed so much of my kids' lives as it is, and I want to be a part of the game, but I want to be able to go when I want to, <laughs> right? I want to be able to, because I grew up like that. My mom was always my team mom. My dad was the coach on every team that I played. So I definitely want to own a team, but I want to be able to see my kids, kids grow up and, appreciate stuff, but I'll go nuts if I ain't doing nothing. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, like I'm one of them people that 
Like, I, if I don't have nothing on my calendar or something, I'd be like, what the hell am I gonna do then? You know, like you want a break, but if you get one, you go nuts. Um, Chris, it's always good to be asked about your legacy when you're 35. Um, <laughs> it, gets you thinking, it gets you thinking way in advance. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's awesome. Tony, thanks for the great, uh -oh. thank you to all of my, my co-moderators. Um, I'm going to go to some audience questions. I saw one, and I'm sorry because there are so many. Um, um, Reagan, you pointed out, was it Eddie? Um, Eddie's son had a question. Um, Eddie, you want to unmute yourself if you're on? And I apologize if uh, you're yeah, uh um, thanks, Chris, for uh, joining us for this panel. Um, my question was about uh, your presidency as the leader of the Players Association. Um, <laughs> and my question was about how important do you think it is to be versed in labor negotiations and labor rights? And how much do you consider being the president of the Players Union? Um, like, how much do you consider the Players Union to be a true labor union? Or do you believe it's something different? Man, that's a deep question. I could tell you <laughs> a, a lot of stuff. It's, first and foremost, you want to know how I sort of became president, right? Eddie, you turn the video off or is that? Is he there? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep my oh, video. No, yeah, because I'm like talking to you. Um, <laughs> so the way I became president, I was on the executive committee, right? So we have an executive committee of players and I was cool being in that position because I got a chance to sort of help make decisions on certain stuff but it wasn't, I wasn't on calls all the time, right? So I was cool being in that position and we were in Vegas. We were in Vegas for a meeting. We had our big player meeting in Vegas and the player, a few players came and was like, yo, Chris, we, we think you should be the president. And I was like, what? <laughs> they was like, we think you should be the president. And I was like, man, I ain't got that kind of time. I'm trying to set up my own business. I'm trying to get my own stuff structured in my own life right. And we don't have an executive director right now that mean we gonna have to do interviews and all this. And then I went to my wife who was in the room and I asked her, I seriously asked her. And she was like, well, I think if they ask you, you need to do it. And I ain't gonna lie, if she would have said no, I would have said no. I was looking for her out. <laughs> I was kind of looking for her out. And so I did it and that next day, and I, I might've talked about this on Russ's podcast, but I'll tell you, it was so crazy because it happens right there. So all the players in the room, they say, who are the nominations for a president? And somebody has to nominate you, right? So I got nominated, I think Roger Mason, who was on the executive committee sitting right next to me, he got nominated too. The players go out the room and they come right back in. It's kind of weird, like it just gets announced right there. And I got overwhelmed, I got overwhelmed, flew back home, woke up the next morning, hit Carmen that works for me and it's like, I'm resigning. There's too much anxiety already, I can't do it. <laughs> Seriously, I told her I resigned and then they talked talk me out of it. And then I learned so much. I learned so much. And I tell you this, Eddie, when you're a young guy and you come into the NBA and you go into CBA negotiations and you go to this big table and you sit across the table and you see Michael Jordan, you see Mark Cuban, you see uh, Mark Lazary, you see uh, Clay Bennett, uh, Robert Sarver. I could run off all of the different governors of the league you like, I just got to sit back and shut up, right? It's intimidating, right? But that is the part that I think when I was on executive committee over the years, I realized, look, they human just like me and these conversations have to happen, right? So when you talk about um, a union, I've, I've learned so many different things and how everything has to be done a certain way. And this is what happens at times too with me being the president is people will call me and be like, yo, yo, Chris, we need to do such and such. Oh, we need to do such and such. Oh, they don't like this. I, don't, I always have to remind people, this ain't CP3 Inc. <laughs> right? This ain't CP3 Inc. Like this is the Players Association, <laughs> right? So this isn't my business. So I'm in a leadership position, but everything always has to be voted on and stuff. And the last thing I'll say real quick too, and I know I talk about him all the time, my family probably hear about him all the time. And I keep like Bob, what I'll say is I've learned is succession planning, right? That was one of the biggest things. So I, I've been the president for four years and it was like, all right, I'm done. I'm cool. I'm done. But I was like, no, 
no, you can't do that. Because to tell you the truth, the NBA doesn't work like that. You guys know who David Stern is? David Stern was the commissioner of the league. Adam Silver was right here for a while, learning, learning, right? And so when my four-year term was up initially, it was like, that's kind of tough. If I just say, okay, I'm not the president no more, somebody else come in, right? Then it's just a, a cycle that you just never like sort of keep progressing. So for me, I've tried to find a couple guys that's on the executive committee to keep them abreast of all the things that's going on so that when they become president also, it just, I would have never known that, but you learn that in business. That's the way companies keep thriving. Um, hey, Chris, we have like two minutes left. Are you okay taking another question or two? Of course. I ain't, well, yeah, my kids got lunch. They in school. <laughs> um, thank you. So I'm going to go to Lauren. I think your last name is Helmbrecht. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Go ahead and unmute yourself um, and ask your question if you would. Lauren, are you there? Hi. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Oh, great. There you are. Okay. Hi. So I had a question as the president of the NBA PA. You have to deal with quite a few different personalities and extremely passionate people. As a leader, what advice do you have for uniting and bringing people together? Great question. Uh, for me, um, everybody has different leadership styles, right? And I think one of the biggest ways um, that I've tried to lead is time, right? Because time is the most important thing that any of us have. And so when I went to Oklahoma City, I was thrown into a new position, right? With a new team and, and a lot of younger guys. And it actually worked out perfect for me, honestly, that my family didn't go, right? Because it gave me more time to invest in the different guys. I was bringing the guys after practice over to my house, play cards, have a good time or whatnot. So that's one part of it. You invest real time. But the other thing is they got to know that you're working harder than any of them, right? You, you really got to put the work in and you got to this is the thing too. You gotta be as honest as possible. You know what I mean? You gotta be very straightforward. And I think that's what I've learned. And that's why I say everybody's not gonna like you, but at the end of the day, they'll respect that you at least told them or had this conversation. Because if we always just sort of tiptoeing around lying to each other, then we never get anywhere. But if we were working to something and I'm like, man, if it's one of my teammates and I'm like, look, man, you staying out a little bit too late and it's showing on the court. Instead of everybody talking around his back, like, man, this fool just don't never, he, you know, <laughs> if you tell yeah. him, if you tell him, you know what I mean? Maybe, it, maybe it'll change a little bit. And so I think for me, uh, talking basketball, as far as like leadership, and I had to prove myself. <laughs> That's, that was the craziest part. I've been in the league. 14 years already and I get there, but I know because that's another thing when you talk about journalism or media, they can sort of write a narrative. So coming from Houston, everybody's like, he old, he's sorry or whatnot. And your teammates might not say that to you, but they didn't hurt it. So that was the thing for me in Oklahoma City. I invested time with all the guys and then you got to show them that you put the work in and that you, you're not what they saying you are. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, Mateo Gutierrez, are you still on? Yeah, oh, I'm I on. See you in front of me. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi, Chris. Uh, good, good to see you. Uh, just a side note: if you're looking for someone to go when you retire, Wizards, great team. They could use you. You know. <laughs> but um, my my question though, um, so when Adam Silver took um overtook NBA commissioner duties, I actually was wondering. How were your first interactions and how did your relationship with Adam like progress throughout the years, especially after like when he first overtook duties and he banned Donald Sterling from NBA affiliation for life? How did your relationship with him kind of like, progress throughout your uh, career as he was commissioner? Tell you, man, I got some good questions on here because I don't even remember back then. But um, let me think. It's, it's crazy because I obviously sort of knew Adam because of him being in the deputy position, right? And I don't even remember what the transition was like because so much was going on, but I do remember um, the, the one thing about my relationship with Adam, right? Which has been unbelievable. And I can remember, uh, rest in peace, David, but 
the communication wasn't like it is now, right? It was nowhere near the way it is now. And I'm, I'm so glad that me and Adam have sort of built that. And it's not always, hey, everything's good, everything. No, it's not. And so sometimes he has to hear me out as well as I have to hear him out. But um, going through that Donald Sterling situation, I think was a, a big piece of that. But just all the time, I'll tell you a, a quick story. We were doing the CBA negotiations and because I had done it as a younger player when I was a president, I had been in these meetings. So during the 2011 lockout when we, we were having meetings, one time we had like a 16 hour meeting, right? I'll never forget it. It was at a hotel in New York. And I remember I was just gradually putting on weight and didn't know why. It's because I was eating pretzels and stuff like that during the meetings all day. But during those meetings, what I learned is that there was so much posturing going on, right? We would go in these meetings and sit across from the governors and we would argue and talk for hours. And then we'd go back and meet together. And then we'd go back in there and this happened for a long time, right? Everybody in suits. And I got a vivid image in my head of David Stern sitting there with his tie undone. And we just be in there all day. So when we first started negotiations, uh, when I was president the last time, um, I sent warm-up suits. I sent warm-up suits to all the governors, sent them warm-up suits, right? And told them like, let's come into this meeting. <laughs> like, you ain't gotta wear a suit. I don't really care if you wear a suit. It's about getting done what we need to get done. And so that's been the big thing like with Adam. It's like, it ain't a whole bunch of, don't come to us with something that's, that's not real, right? Don't come to us with some, some dumb stuff. If we really trying to get stuff done, let's just be straightforward and, and honest about it. And sometimes some of those conversations happens with him and Michelle. Sometimes they happen with just me and him, but uh, we, we, we've had an opportunity to build that trust. Um, Chris, I'm going to do you. one last question. Thanks for that, Mateo. Um, and this is from, it looks like Stephanie um, Hawko, um, who's a mom of a grad student. Stephanie, there you are. Hugo, Hi. sorry. Hugo, sorry. I okay. <laughs> Um, well, I had a, a couple different questions. Um, you, I'm also in grad school. The one about strategic, mother. you do the, hey, Stephanie, will you ask the one about strategic partnerships and explain, yeah. give, give a little bit of your backstory as you did in the chat. Of course. So I'm a mom, I have a young daughter and I'm in grad school. So I understand the complexities that you're facing um, being in school and also having multiple full-time jobs. Um, I guess I just really want to know how you choose your strategic partnerships in that I've had a few classes about corporate communications and you've gone with partnerships with Beyond Me and State Farm and they all seem geared towards uh, furthering the future and also kind of what is going on currently. So how, how do you choose them? And that's a great question. And I, um, I have an unbelievable team, as you have heard me say, uh, woman named Carmen Wilson, and obviously my older brother works for me as my business manager, and a guy named Robbie Robinson. I got an amazing team of people that, that work with me. But the way we come up with the strategic partnerships is it has to make sense. And that's why I'm glad, like I said, this is year 15. When I was younger, when I came into the NBA, it was like, y'all want me to do that? You want me to hold that up? And you're going to pay me? Just, okay, cool. Right, right. But as, as, as I got older, I realized that it, it has to be um, authentic, right? I can't say anything about it unless it's real to me. So my partnership with Beyond Me, while it started, initially my investment started in, and I wasn't completely plant-based, but I was doing Beyond Me after games in Houston a lot of times. And then once I became fully plant-based, I had an opportunity to sit down with Ethan Brown and my team and we asked questions. Whatever partnership it is, it's like, what is, what is the goal? What does the future look like? Um, how are you guys hiring people of color? You know, like seriously. Right. And I, I tell you, I'm, I'm working on a movie right now called The Data Sports to Steel. We ask these questions, no matter what company is, no matter what the partnership is, just like with State Farm. I'll say this about State Farm while it's been an unbelievable run in making these fun commercials over the years. We really um, do things in the community, right? 
So it was never just about the commercials. It was like, okay, we'll do this, but we've been in the different inner cities um, re redoing um, learning centers, right? So we've been trying to bridge the, the education, education gap with technology. So yeah. if we come in, if my team comes in, we really come in. <laughs> like we really come in and we make sure that there's never gonna be a situation where somebody's like, well, what y'all doing? Why, why is this this way? You know, and change has to start somewhere. So like you said, we're very, very strategic in, in what it is because your brand, and I'm sure that's a whole nother thing, but your brand, I think is a lot more important, right? Than a dollar amount. And, and yeah, for my little cousin, uh, AJ, my little cousin, AJ, who works, works for me and works with me, we had a, a deal that came across the table recently from like a certain tequila company or whatnot, right? And he looked at the number and he was like, what, you gonna do that, right? I was like, no, <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't make sense and it's not on brand, right? So, um, yeah. I think that's what's great about you, if I can say, Chris, that you pick things that are very in line with what you feel. For example, Beyond Meat, something that benefits future generations, yourself also included, and with State Farm, it's something that more benefits you now and for the future. And so thank you for that insight because it's interesting how people choose. So it's nice to know the reasons why because we don't get to see that very often. So thank you. No problem. Um, Chris, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this now. Um, we have hundreds of questions in the, ch in the chat that we will get to. I may send them to you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to my co-moderators, Sam Arslany and Tony Hall and Reagan Griffin Jr. You guys did a great job, as did the audience with all the fantastic questions. Chris, please know we're always grateful to you for joining us, for your candor, um, and frankly, for your leadership. And we're watching and we're cheering you on. Thank y'all so much. And if anybody want any extra communication homework, holler at me. Just let me know. <laughs> if you need tutors, if you need tutors, let us know. We got plenty. All right. Be careful, Willow. <laughs> <laughs> I will. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And yeah. everybody, can you, can, you can unmute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.